need to get to another reality. Tintin. The Bell Vision series. So Tintin had his own magazine thanks to Hergé's friend Raymond Leblanc. But Leblanc did not only create the magazine Tintin, he also founded a film studio. It was called Belle Vision or Belle Vision if you like. After turning other Franco-Belgian comics into cartoons, they began working on an adaptation of Tintin in 1957. So Bell Vision and the French television started a cooperation and produced two episodes from Two Adventures of Tintin. These two episodes are King Ottokar's Scepter and The Broken Ear. Hergé wasn't taking part personally in the project, only providing drawings. However, the studio wasn't allowed to re-edit those drawings. And the result, which is clearly seen in King Ottokar's Scepter, is more or less a photographed comic strip, only minus the speech bubbles. And there were no voiceover actors in both episodes. There was just a narrator telling the story and also performing all of the characters. Including Bianca Castafiore and I might add it was a male narrator. Both episodes were shot on 60mm film and in black and white. In the episode The Broken Ear there was some sort of animation happening. Although the movements of the characters are a bit mechanical and stiff. French television was rather disappointed with the results and although both episodes were aired, the TV station terminated the contract afterwards. However, the project was continued. New director Ray Gossens insisted on producing the show on celluloid. And with American TV producer Larry Harmon, Bell Vision had a new production partner. Also, there was a new scriptwriter named Charlie Shows, and the first project of the new series was... Destination Moon. Well, old problems seem to be solved, but new problems are arising. The American partner bails out. And this was at a time when the episode Destination Moon was already in the midst of production. It is Raymond Leblanc who finds a new partner for the project. The French company Teleaget. So all problems are solved now, yes? No they aren't. One of the problems is the writer of the show, Charlie Shows. He takes a lot of liberties in the adaptation of the comic books. But six of the Tintin books get made into episodes. And each episode is broken down in parts of 5 minutes duration. The adapted stories are The Shooting Star, Destination Moon, The Secret of the Unicorn, Red Rackham's Treasure, The Black Island and The Crab with the Golden Claws. Due to the differences with Charlie's shows and the fact that Tele Hachette also was not satisfied with the result, Belvision brought in comic book writer Michel Renier, known under his pen name Greg. He came in to work over show's scripts, but it didn't help. After six episodes, Tele Hachette terminated the contract. Raymond Leblanc decided to produce one more episode on his own, and this was The Calculus Affair. The series is very famous for the changes they made in adaptation, and I want to take a look at some of these changes. First, let's take a look at basic premises they changed. Number one, in the run of the series, Professor Calculus is not hard hearing. He also doesn't wear his green coat. His coat is sometimes yellow, sometimes brown. Thompson and Thompson have the same moustache in some of the scenes, although in the comic they are different, and in one scene they are called brothers. The biggest change is there is no episode where the characters meet for the first time. So Tintin and Haddock and Calculus know each other from the beginning. 
As a consequence, they are appearing in adventures, although they are not part of the comic of the same episode. Interestingly, the shooting star is referred as volume 1 of these adventures, so let's take a look at this special episode first. And this is the episode you already see on the TV screen. So, after Tintin has discovered the mysterious new star in the sky, he goes right to the observatory. And the head of the observatory is not Professor Decimus Fossil, like in the comic book, it is Professor Calculus. His assistant is the so-called Prophet Philippoulos from the comic book. And he's doing the miscalculation, thinking that the shooting star will collide with Earth. And so he foretells the end of the world. That doesn't happen as we know. Thompson and Thompson are in this story, although they are not in the comic book. And the new found material on the mysterious star in the comic book is called Fossilite after Fossil. But in the TV episode it is Calculus who makes the discovery. So the new element is called Calculusite. Calculite. Calcul... I think you get what I mean. The saboteur who brings the dynamite aboard Haddock's ship escapes in the comic book. In the TV episode he is captured alongside the prophet Philippoulos. And as you can see, in this episode it's not just a piece of dynamite, it's a bomb in a suitcase. Haddock's ship isn't called Aurora in this episode, it's called Sirius. Sirius is the ship of Captain Chester, whom Tintin and Haddock meet in the comic book. Oh and by the way, the whole thing seems to be a private expedition of Calculus and Haddock, as the European Research Society and its scientists are not appearing in this story here. On the trip to the shooting star we learn that there is a second saboteur aboard Haddock's ship and he manages to plant a second bomb. In addition to that a submarine is following the Sirius and attacks the ship with torpedoes. Well, This reminds of a similar scene in the comic book The Red Sea Sharks. The second bomb of the saboteur damages the Sirius heavily and is the reason why Tintin must take the plane to get to the meteoroid. In the comic book it's just to be quicker than the others. In the cartoon episode Tintin is accompanied by Professor Calculus. They spot the ship of the rival expedition and get shot. In the comic book no shots were fired from the rival ship, to the contrary, the captain even stops his own crew from doing so. As his plane is damaged Tintin has to do an emergency landing on the meteoroid. The plane is crashing and destroyed. The crew of the rival ship also gets on the meteoroid and a wild chase ensues. The chase ends abruptly when the giant spider appears. Tintin gets briefly caught in a stone avalanche, but no problem, one of the giant trees grows conveniently at the same spot, moving the stones aside and Tintin gets free. And in the end, when the meteoroid starts collapsing, Haddock turns up with a second water plane and he happens to save everybody in the last second. Ok, from the mysterious star let's get to Destination Moon, the episode that is listed as number 2, but obviously it was the first that was produced. The most interesting and unique fact is that in the first minutes of the episode Tintin turns directly to the viewer and tells about his past adventures. The whole scene takes place in a plane where Tintin and Haddock are traveling to Sildavia to meet Professor Calculus. The whole thing has the spirit of some sort of introduction, so I think that this was meant to be, well, some sort of pilot episode. As a matter of fact, when you look at the clips that are being shown, it seems to point a bit at the episodes Tintin in the Congo, the Red Sea Sharks and the Crab with the Golden Claws. Well, the last story was also turned into an episode and we see in this clip Professor Calculus who is not appearing in this episode. Let's take a look at the other changes. Haddox and Tintin's plane has a rough landing in Soldavia. The test rocket's color is all white and there's only one spy parachuting from an aeroplane. This spy turns out to be Jorgen who will be later sneaking aboard the moon rocket. As a matter of fact, Although King Ottokar's scepter was turned into an episode, it seems like Jorgen and Tintin are unfamiliar with each other. 
Snowy finds Jorgen sneaking around on the area. Jorgen kicks the dog into the test rocket so that he doesn't get discovered too soon. And by pulling one single lever, Jorgen manages to launch the rocket into space. I mean, shouldn't there be control room personnel or something? Due to the untimely start, Calculus wants to destroy the test rocket, but in the last second he discovers that Snowy is aboard. Now Jorgen kicks in and wants to pull the destruction lever. He manages to overwhelm Tintin, but is finally stopped by Captain Haddock. Oh, and by the way, in these stories Captain Haddock is not so much into whiskey, but into coffee. Yes, coffee. Oh well, the experimental rocket isn't destroyed, but Snowy finally lands on the moon. So the moon mission of Calculus has to speed up. And the research mission has become a rescue mission. But first Thompson and Thompson enter the scene. But not like in the comic book, dressed as traditional Greeks. Here they land with a parachute. And you can see how episodic these stories were planned, because the first thing that happens after the rocket leaves Earth is that it accidentally gets into a meteoroid field. It's a bit like these old Flash Gordon serials where they leap from danger to danger from week to week. And I already stated Haddock is not so much into whiskey, but into coffee. So in the scene where the rocket gains weightlessness, it's not whiskey that floats out of his glass, but it's coffee floating from a cup. And while in the comic book the adventures of Haddock getting out of the rocket in a spacesuit and flying off is due to his alcohol consume, however it's completely different in this story. Tintin and Haddock are outside of the rocket to check for damages when Haddock takes his magnetic boots off because his feet are aching. Seeing things like this, it's no wonder that Hergé was not very enthusiastic about this show. But picture this, Tintin is hanging on a rope following the captain to rescue him. And then a saboteur shows up, cutting the rope. Because it's so easy to put yourself in an astronaut suit just to cut some rope, I think. And through this, the explorers already know that there's a saboteur on board, in contrast to the comic book. And although there's a limited number of suspects aboard the rocket, they don't have a clue. Even when they are on the moon and calculus assistant Wolf does not only pull up the ladder, close the door and even starts the engines of the rocket for a few seconds, they don't get suspicious. Wolf says it was an accident and they just go with it. Hey, things like this don't happen in a rocket just because you push the wrong buttons. And if they suspect that there's a blind passenger aboard, why didn't they search the rocket for crying out loud? It's not so much space. But finally Tintin explores the moon and finds the rocket with Snowy aboard. But as Tintin and Snowy are low on oxygen, Calculus decides to follow them in well, what looks like a land speeder from Star Wars. It's a shame because Hergé put so much work into researching the details to make it realistic. During a second excursion, Calculus, Haddock and Thompson are trapped in a cave due to an avalanche. Tintin wants to go out and help them, but in this very moment he's overwhelmed by Jorgen. But like in the comic book, Tintin can free himself and so he sends Snowy off with dynamite. Yes, dynamite. And here on the Earth's moon, where there is no atmosphere, Calculus manages to light up the dynamite and blow away the rocks that block the entrance of the cave. A fuse that burns in space. You know, the space where the air isn't. Like in the comic, our heroes can overwhelm the bad guys and go on a return flight. Then the bad guys get free, but Wolf has a change of heart and stops Jorgen. And nobody dies, unlike in the comic book, where Jorgen gets killed by a ricocheted bullet and Wolf commits suicide later on. Everybody lives. But there's still a trouble ahead and, I use that phrase again, unlike in the comic book, the landing does not go well. The rocket is crashing into a rock and falls to the side. But everybody's rescued. So there we have it. 
This episode can stand as a prime example why Hergé didn't like the show. Yes, adaptation means changing some things, but these changes... well... Next story in the series is The Secret of the Unicorn. First big change. Neither the collector Ivan Ivanovich Sakharin nor Barnaby, the henchman of the brothers Bird, appear in this story. And the first attempt to steal the ship model of the unicorn from Tintin is made while Tintin is still on his way back home. Later on, when Snowy damages the model ship, Tintin discovers the parchment of Sir Francis Haddock immediately. And 12 seconds later, the brothers Bird try to overwhelm Tintin. Instead of breaking into Tintin's apartment and stealing the model ship while the reporter is absent. Tintin discovers the third model of the unicorn by accident in an antique shop. Tintin gets captured after he leaves Haddock's apartment, from whom he learned the story of Sir Francis Haddock and the unicorn. The brothers Bird bring their captive not to Marlin Spike like in a comic, but to a place, we see it here on the screen, named Hudson Manor. As far as I've learned is that uh, the producers wanted the show to look more American. You can also see it from the policeman we've seen in a scene earlier, because he looks more like an American policeman rather than a Belgian one. And when one of the Bird brothers tries to escape at the end of the story, there's a wild chase going on, at the end of which Thompson and Thompson run into an American sheriff. Yes, and that's all for this story. It continues in Red Rackham's Treasure. Like in the comic book, Max Bird escapes from police custody in the end of this story, but in the comic book Red Rackham's Treasure he doesn't show up. But hey, you guessed it, it's one of the changes from comic book to TV show. Max Bird will play an active part in this episode of the TV show, as we will see. And the other big change, as Tintin and Calculus know each other from uh, episodes before, it's not like Tintin meets the Professor for the first time in this story, Calculus just shows up and brings along his mini-submarine. And this is the only story where Calculus is really hard hearing, like in the comics, but in this episode it's due to an explosion and the hard hearing is only temporarily. Max Bird manages to bring a henchman of him on board of Haddock's ship and this henchman places a bomb in the ship. Well, we haven't seen this before, have we? But he also manages to find out the coordinates of the wreck of the unicorn. The unicorn sank close to an island and this island, oh boy. In the comic it's a deserted jungle island inhabited by monkeys and parrots. Natives are mentioned, but never seen. In the TV show, natives are seen, and not only that, they also capture Thompson and Thompson. And they are the cliché manhunters you would expect from a show from that era. During his first excursion with the mini-submarine, Tintin gets attacked by a shark. And later on, when he tries to explore the wreck of the unicorn in a diving suit, it's Max Bird showing up. The incident with the shark that swallows the bottle of rum does not happen to Tintin, but to Haddock. And it's Haddock who finds the chest with the documents. And when our heroes make a second trip to the island, they get attacked by the natives again, but this attack is being stopped by a volcanic eruption. Yes, a volcanic eruption. And by finding the treasure in Marlinspike or Hudson Manor as it's called here, this story ends and the Black Island begins. And as I already mentioned, the Black Island is from a time before Tintin knew Haddock and Calculus, but here in the TV show they are incorporated in the story. Haddock is even staying with Tintin throughout the whole adventure. But as we can see here, the first encounter with the plane that makes the emergency landing they have together. Now, in the comic book, the bad guys fool Thompson and Thompson into thinking that Tintin must be arrested. And all these events take place on a train. However, in this TV show, it's an airport. Tintin and Haddock escape from Thompson and Thompson by hiding in mailbags that are mailed to England. So they end up in a freight machine, but are separated for a moment. And Tintin jumps off the plane with a parachute. 
from a freight machine. Freight machines are flying at a too high altitude. You can't jump off. You would freeze immediately to death. It seems like some events are just written into the episode to make the story progress faster. But well, back on the ground, Tintin and Haddock are reunited. Then they meet one of the bad guys, Dr. Müller. He looks a bit different than in the comic. In the comic he has black hair, here it's white, so they made him a bit older. And in the comic, Müller isn't the head of the operation, but here he is. And later on, in the comic book, Tintin rips his clothes on some thorns, and as a result he has to change clothes and is dressed in a kilt for the rest of the story. This doesn't happen here, Tintin keeps his outfit until the end of the story. And at the end of the story, when the monster of the Black Island has its big appearance, so uh, the gorilla that is kept there, it's not that Snowy barks and the gorilla falls down the stairs, but Snowy barks and the gorilla is tame from that moment on. So no animals were hurt in the production of this episode. Yeah, and that's that. Now let's get on to the next adventure, the crab with the golden claws. It's here where it's very apparent that the studio, due to save time and money, is reusing existing panels. Because at the start of the story it happens three times that Thompson and Thompson are falling in the sea. First each one individual, then both together with their car and one final time when they are getting off the Karabujan. And each time it happens you see exactly the same splash of water coming up. And they also saved scenes by having characters describe what they see, but the audience doesn't see. Because at the beginning Tintin eyewitnesses the murder of the sailor from the Karabujan. But we don't see what happens, Tintin just tells us what he sees. And a few moments later it's the same when Thompson and Thompson are falling in the water. They climb back up and tell that there's a dead body in the water, but we don't get to see it. And as Tintin and Haddock know each other in the TV show already, when the name Karabujan comes up, Tintin instantly knows that it's the ship of Captain Haddock. When Tintin gets captured and locked into the cargo hold of the Karabujan, there's a storm coming up. And through the storm, water is leaking into the cargo hold. The water is rising and Tintin is in danger, for a few moments at least. And in the comic book, the crab cans are used for smuggling drugs. Here in the story, they are used for smuggling as well, but it's diamonds. And of course, the smuggling isn't done by Haddock himself, but his first officer, Alan. In the comic book, Alan uses alcohol to keep Haddock calm. But as we know, Haddock isn't into alcohol in the TV show, so Alan has to drug him to keep him calm. And of course, Haddock doesn't get drunk and causing all the calamities like in the comic book. For example, when he and Tintin escape from the Karabujan in a lifeboat, in the comic Haddock, being drunk sets the lifeboat on fire because it's so cold. As a result, the lifeboat flips over. Here, the lifeboat flips over when the water plane arrives and starts shooting on them. And in the comic book, after they overwhelm the pilots of the water plane, they fly off, Haddock gets drunk again and knocks Tintin out while flying, so the plane crashes. Here, the overwhelmed pilots can free themselves and overwhelm Haddock and Tintin in return. Then Haddock can free himself overwhelming the pilots again, but Tintin isn't awake yet and Haddock tries to fly, thus crashing the plane. Can a cartoon plot be more complicated? The answer is yes it can, but that's not my point. And an extra episode is added after they crash the plane. They get briefly captured by a Bedouin, but then there's a sandstorm coming up. And finally, then they got rescued by the desert soldiers, like in the comic book. When Alan renames the Karabujan upon arriving in Morocco, he doesn't call it Jebel Amila, like in the book, but Tangiers, for whatever reason. Alan and his henchmen try to escape with the Karabujan, and then all the henchmen 
get killed. Yeah. Because Alan plants a bomb and there's an explosion and only Alan survives. And that's pretty dark for this TV show. The whole time they try to avoid showing too much violence and then that. Well, that's the end of this story and now we come to the last made for TV episode of this show. And as mentioned earlier, it's the Calculus Affair. Well, first big change, the character Joylon Wack, having his first appearance in this comic book, is removed completely from this episode. And second big change, in this adaptation it's not a competition between rivaling secret services from Saldavia and Borduria. They are only agents from Borduria involved. And so there are no incidents like in the comic book at the beginning in the park of Marlinspike. There are only Bordurian agents strolling around. No shooting, nothing. But like in the book, glasses are breaking around Marlinspike for no apparent reason. Tintin and Haddock don't know what's going on, so they call Thompson and Thompson for help. So, Thompson and Thompson arrive on the scene in a helicopter, yes. The car they use in the comic book seems to have gotten out of fashion. I don't know. Anyway, Calculus is pointing his ultrasound cannon at the helicopter and shoots it down? Holy sh**! Calculus, what are you doing? I mean, one scene later he says that he didn't expect his weapon to be this effective, but even he must think of the possibility that it's not a very good idea of breaking the windows of a cockpit of a helicopter in flight. And by the way, did you see what this ultrasound cannon emits? It looks more like a laser beam. Or like the streams from the Ghostbusters backpacks. Anyway, Hergé did a whole lot of research for the story and this is what they made of it. And in the comic book, Tintin and Haddock have to put these little pieces together to find out what's happening and what Calculus was working on. Here, Calculus just tells them right from the start. And there's also no Congress in Geneva where Calculus has to go to. Now, Calculus has made this big ultrasound cannon, but he also made a small one, conveniently. Small enough to put it in your pocket or a suitcase and so the Bordurian agents enter to steal it. They do so by throwing a smoke grenade into the laboratory and just beat everyone up. Well, Calculus says it's done no harm because there are only two persons in the world that can operate the ultrasound cannon. That's himself and the Soldavian Professor Bretzel. Professor Bretzel is a replacement for Professor Topolino in the comic book. And all the parts of the story that are taking place in Switzerland in the comic book are relocated for this story to Sildavia. And obviously Sildavia is no longer an Eastern European state, but it's formed after Austria. The name Professor Bretzel is a hint to that. And while having a telephone call with Tintin, Professor Bretzel speaks real German. But the phone call gets interrupted and that's why Tintin, Haddock and Calculus travel to Sildavia. Here they are lured into a trap and Calculus gets caught as well. And while in the comic Professor Topolino's house gets blown up, this time the bad guys just set it on fire. But now the Sildavian police is taking notice and a wild chase starts. The chase ends at a lake where a Bodurian submarine shows up. The Bodurian agent now capture everybody, including Tintin, who got injured during the chase. And when the captain of the submarine says they are now all brought to Borduria, Calculus says something strange. He says that his home country is Sildavia and will always be. That's a bit strange, because Hergé never stated the nationality of Calculus in the comics. And he never hinted at the fact that Calculus could be anything else than Belgian. Thompson and Thompson are playing a bigger part in this story as they follow our heroes to Sildavia and get involved in everything. This comes now into play as Tintin manages to escape because he was on the sick bay. Well now, Tintin's on the run, but as Haddock is still captured, it's Thompson and Thompson who play the part that Haddock is playing in the comic book, for example, when they flee into the opera house. 
It's here where we meet Colonel Sponge. Well, um, the look-alike at least, because he's called Colonel Brutel in this. Like in the comic book, Tintin steals from Sponge the papers that will bring Calculus and Haddock to freedom. So he and Thompson and Thompson go into the prison in disguise, but are discovered very soon. In right another change from the comic book, they have to find their way out together with Calculus and Haddock. And we have yet another chase scene where they use the ultrasound cannon and then they get hand on a tank and escape like in the comic book. Yes, and with this episode in 1964, seven years after the whole thing started, the first TV show of Tintin was cancelled. But this wasn't the last Tintin project we would see from Bell Vision. They would go on and produce two Tintin motion pictures, Prisoners of the Sun and The Lake of Sharks. But this would take some time after the end of the show. Because during the run of the TV show, there was something else. Two Tintin movies with real actors and real places were produced. But this is yet another story and shall be told another time. Diamonds and one moment. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven diamonds, like seven crystal balls. Does this have to mean something? <laughs> 